decades ago, uh, Aldo Lippo said there are people who can, those who can, can live without law and those who cannot. Uh, I have to be one of those who cannot. And I'm assuming that most of y'all cannot either. <coughs> Uh, my purpose today is to provide testimony uh, that thus restoring habitat is the best way to keep those wild things or restore those wild things. And uh, restoring habitat from all other factors I know of <coughs> in conserving natural resources, including wildlife. Uh, I uh, Last year ago, one of these conferences, what is what is prayer? And I'm a, you know, I'm not a biologist or botanist like many people in the room or around here. Uh, my experience was the only way I could define a prayer, and that's been restoring habitat on our our ranch and those of our neighbors. So I didn't give a textbook answer. My answer was, it's all about the bees, and the bees happen to be uh, blue bonnets, blue bells, and other types of wildflowers box turtles, butterflies, blue, blue stem grasses, and other types of bunch grasses, and sometimes even bird dogs, like you know, Brittany, uh, uh, who's pointing, as you'll see in a moment, uh, Bob White Quail. <laughs> That's what that area of that dog was standing looked like when we bought it on a ranch. Uh, and needless to say, when the, when the experts came out, <coughs> to uh, tell me what I need to do and look at the site over, those from NRCS, Texas Parks and Wildlife, Audubon, you name it. Most of them agreed that the, the, the decision was unanimous. I had a wildlife measure, and I did. Uh, but it didn't discourage me. It actually gave me, made me more determined that I was going to do something about that. And we were going to restore this wildlife desert uh, to have more bob white quail. So uh, I went out and asked the experts, where is that mentor I can talk to? And uh, they sort of rolled their eyes because there were a lot of programs, but there wasn't anybody that done that. We've been researching it for years. We've been talking about it for years. But there wasn't anybody who could be my mentor. And so I said, well, where, where's the pioneer? And the answer was, you are the pioneer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, we so not, there not being anybody who put it on the ground, uh, we decided to use, uh, my methodology was simple. Fail fast, fix fast. And I did a lot of failing and a lot of fixing. More failing, but I learned a lot. We learned a lot. As you see, this is the same picture across the fence. I mean, on our same side of the fence, where we, restored habitat. This took five years. We were lucky, really blessed. The stars lined up. And, and, and as you can see, in five years, we got that kind of standard of, of uh, native grasses. And, uh, and that resulted in <coughs> the next day him wanted to do research on it, and they found 31 species of buffalo birds, including fog white quail. Quail numbers went from just a handful when we got there to actually one bird per acre. I mean, that's you know, a half bird an acre is a lot of quail. We got a bird per acre in five years. And go ahead. we quit putting out fertilizer. We quit all the inputs. Uh, we found out that our neighbors during the summertime even were having to bring in hay because they overgrazed and overhazed. Whereas we never ran out of grass. So obviously we had a lot of moisture in the soil. I had more moisture in that soil where this native grass is. And I'll show you later on a picture of the roots that we talked to, uh, gentleman earlier talked about that we dug out of the ground and show you with the size, the massiveness of these roots that these native grasses have. But improved soil health. I couldn't believe it. I took you know, agronomy courses in school. Nobody ever told me that these native grasses develop such an ecosystem below them. You know, you go out there today and dig on these plants and you find all these earthworm casings. The, the soil was the part of this floor when we started. The picture you saw earlier where the cattle were. <clears throat> it was like a potting soil you buy at Lowe's and buy it here. It's amazing what those plants do to convert that soil mm -hmm. to the state.
stated then now. And we had, of course, all kinds of species of grass and wildflowers because we let the land, land rest. We went from using agronomics to management. We quit thinking we had to do, you put, put commercial fertilizer on and pH and all this, which I was taught and did, and I grew up on a farm, so I used a lot of, to just managing how the land is used, not abused. <coughs> so we had, we've actually not fed a bale of hay in eight years. Say so again. We haven't fed a bale of hay in eight years. Really? Year round grazing. Now, where are you, Jim? Just uh, west of Houston, Cat Spring, uh, north, northeast of Columbus. And that's because if you don't overgraze it, and right at the end of the grazing season, you let the plants grow up to their maximum height, that, that high stature of those plants protects those little succulent annuals and perennials down below. So the cattle have something to graze during the wintertime. It's green down there. If you graze down the ground, it doesn't protect it, but you've got standing cover, these native grasses up there, to protect the little succulent animal. It protects the animals, the livestock, it protects the wildlife, and it protects those little succulent things they eat during the wintertime. I uh, must confess that I bragged too much after we had the success about my quail-proof fence that we developed between our place and because obviously you know what type of fence that they, the quail are on, they're on that all of a sudden. <laughs> but uh, if you're a quail conservationist, you really want your neighbors to do as well. Because quail don't care less about fence. You want your neighbors to have you know high populations too. So I learned and but but you know after we had this success, it I learned not to brag about quail conservation or habitat restoration or your bird dogs, or your grandchildren, because they're always disappointing if you start bragging too much. <laughs> so in a few years, in a few years, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, weather changed. Uh, lots and lots of predators came in, <laughs> and we realized that a fragment is no way to create enough critical mass to sustain a population of bobwhites and other upland birds. you gotta have, you got to have more acres. So, with, with that in mind, Bob Moore here, our chairman and I, and Bob and John Webb started uh, the Wildlife Habitat Federation in 2004. Now, just because we've got this organization called Wildlife Habitat Federation, which is a, a group of landlords, uh, doesn't mean because you got this, this name and it's a pretty logo, you're going to do so. you got to have money. You can't get money just having a logo and a name and want to do the right thing and talking about it. And that's one thing I, I want to say today. One thing that drove me to, to the point I want to create this and do what I did is I kept going to these meetings and just talk, talk, talk. We've got to have this research. We've got to do this. Who's putting it on the ground? That's where it counts. So with this organization form, we did decide to do more talk. We formed a nonprofit, profit 501c3. That enabled us to get the money that we needed from federal, state, and private sources. And, uh, and we did that. We were the first, I guess, conservation innovation grant recipient in the state. And uh, with that, we started developing uh, a quail corridor. This corridor is a, a fence it parallels the outside fence of six ranches. It goes, and we did, we built this fence with the idea that the cattle, which are over here, and this, by the way, this gets down to, and they graze it so hard, it's probably it's just dirt at the end of the grazing season. But you can see it's pretty thick, so the hand grass and the Bermuda, Bermuda grass went right through the middle of that. And we planted, we put in these, these fences that are 150 feet wide corridors three years, but we went, we, they're now, next slide, started our ranch, went all the way to the Atwater Prairie Chicken, seven miles away. We got a seven mile long quarter now. And people begin to say, hey, they, they're really serious. I mean, <laughs> it takes time. You've got to be persistent. You've 
can't just give up. And you go in, I go into the, I used to go into the feed and seed store down the road from him, and I knew immediately who they were talking about because when I walked in the door, the conversation stopped. <laughs> 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 they, they, that was a crazy nut down the road that had all that ragged looking stuff up here and down here. You know, I grew up on a farm. My dad made me clip, you know, keep it all pristine like a golf course. I wasn't doing that all of a sudden. But hey, I had koala. We, we were getting, and we were, we were not grazing cattle. And this guy, he's crazy, but hey, it's working. And <clears throat> so, fast forward, next slide. This, six, uh, six years later, <coughs> this is only, that original corridor is right here. Uh, we started with 200, went to 2,000 acres with that original corridor. This is half of what we're doing now. This is six counties, we're now in 12 counties working with landowners representing 50,000 acres. Uh, Jim, yes. are most of them converting their entire properties? No. 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 And what this we would do, if we're, if some of them are maybe 10% of their total holdings, some of them 20, it just depends. Some of them all, it just depends. So I'm, 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 you, I'm a you know, typical, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics, I'm using all three right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the fact is, is they start and they get 10% of the land or 20% of the land in a corridor, it's affecting so much more and spreading. It's got to start somewhere. And then people ask me, why is 150 feet wide? And I said, that's all I could get. <laughs> and, you know, we'd like to have the whole ranch. And like mine, mine's the whole ranch. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, in addition to getting the rural sites, like we also were working in, ur in urban sites. I'll show you momentarily something uh, where we're doing work down in Indy Anderson and, and we planted down at the Exxon facility this year at their new new headquarters. And we started a new program called the Relic Sea Program, which Chuck, Chuck talked about we need to do what well, we're already doing. It. We're, we're, we're getting landowners to let us harvest their native grass seed. Uh, what makes this work? It's people and that have the knowledge and the machine. I mean, we have what we call a hat. How does that action team? Roy's a member of one of those teams. Ray is here, he came today with us. They, we go out and, and we, every day they come to work, and these people are very enthusiastic. And uh, VR, you've seen them work on your place. They really get with it. And we have, we have with the, these people, we have the right machinery. I call them the uh, Special Forces for Conservation. They have state of the art equipment. I mean, we have we have harvesters that cost eighty thousand dollars. We have we have a lot. We have a million dollars worth of equipment now. We're putting this stuff in with. We started with nothing, but we started with an idea, a concept, and people believe in us now. So <coughs> we're making things happen, and because we've got the black people and we've got the machinery to do it with. Yes. Uh, sometimes the the site's a little daunting when you get into something like this. Uh, we start, it's easy to see what you can do when you got the hay grass, the, the computer grass, but when you can't find your pickup, you know, you got problems. <laughs> uh, but uh, this, this happened to be an area we went to the middle of. Uh, uh, this is back for Chinese town up the McCartney Road, you name it. Uh, hog, wild hogs, uh, you name it. Uh, but you begin to feel good about it. Uh, at least I did, well, I don't know how you felt about it running the dozers. <laughs> when you begin to see some, some, you know, hey, it's daylight out here. <laughs> and pile it up and burn it. Wow, it's getting better. And then when you when you get through, and a year later, you got these natives coming up. There were seed under those those, those trees without having to plant. We got they were just waiting for their time. Native grass seed, if you just if you just take that current out of the way, all of a sudden you got this kind of stuff coming up, and of course, wildlife with it. I, I just had to put this one in. This, the guy, <laughs> this is uh, Roy uh, and, and, and Kenneth dug these things. We planted native grasses, and this is only less than one season's growth. Now, we nailed this in my barn. We nailed it. This is eastern gamma grass, big blue stem, uh, yellow Indian grass. Those, those roots are. Eight to ten feet tall. I mean, we've done this out. We planted these. In, in, yeah. Isn't that amazing? That's what goes on underneath. That's underneath. How'd you dig that out? Yeah, we we had a big hole. We cheated. We cheated. We we took we took seeds of plants and we put them in these. Oh yeah. And leave them on fire. Put them in these cylinders. Call them. 
BBC pines, took them down the ground with a backhoe, planted them, and then they grew down. Okay. Then we pulled the cylinders out. If you come out, if you come out our our, our uh, field tour tomorrow, you'll see something we dug out this year. But that's that's uh, that's one season, one season. And I go on about this. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's just, Nobody ever told me in my agronomy class that you got these kind of plants. That, you know, get rid of these plants. Put it in good grass, you know. Well, I want to put them here for a reason. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Lessons learned. Uh, next. Can we get nothing happened? Oh, there we go. Uh, 3,400 years ago, you know, they were written in Leviticus. So you've got to let your land rest one out of seven years. It's amazing what comes out of the ground. Every square, every square of an inch of soil, there's 500 seed out there where we are. 500 seed. So if you let it rest, man, where'd this come from? <laughs> Keep the cows off for a while. Find out what you got there. Plant the seed if you're going to plant in a well-prepared seed pitch or in, in cover crop stubble. And that's what we like to plant with no-till drills in cover crop stubble because, you know, you've got that, you've got that, hard seed bed and, and, and you got something to protect the, the, the newly emerging seed when they come up. Be patient, persistent. These grasses, they sleep, they creep, and they leave. Um, <laughs> harvest or, oak, or graze just the top, top half of the plant. Leave the bottom for the soil and for the wildlife or whatever is out there. Just take the top. And actually, if you only harvest the top of the half the plant, um, it comes back. It comes out faster. You have to produce more forage if you don't cut it down on the ground and graze it on the ground. You, if you just keep, if you manage it, mm -hmm. don't overgraze, don't overcut it for hay. And I used to, I had two farm equipment dealerships one time. I used to sell people, hey man, cut that, cut it close grass you get. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you get rid of one, another comes behind. As I said, there's 500 squeeze, seeds, seeds per square inch. <laughs> 500 seed per square inch out there, so you, you get rid of one thing, something else dominates. Nature abhors a void. So once you get rid of something, it's going to find something to replace it. You might not like what comes up. Get rid of that. Eventually, you'll get something you like. Uh, we like color crops, multiple herbicide treatments. Go ahead. Uh, best stands have been a, we found a, a mixture of local eagle types that we harvest with commercially available germplasm, which we get from commercial seed dealers. We have a mixture of about 20, 80 right now, which works really good. Uh, the reason we don't go 100% local ecotypes is because the first year, you don't get much response. Most local ecotypes are about 85% dormant, so that you don't get much germination the first year. So you gotta put some local, some commercial stuff, like, you know, comes up the first year, like uh, green spring will pop, and it's early successful plants in there to compete with what else is going to come that you don't want to come up in that ground. You know, the resurgence of KR or or Robita grass, whatever. So you got to have both to really make it effective. We harvest our own seed. This was built for us in Billings, Montana. Uh, I don't know what I told you about. It cost eighty thousand dollars. <laughs> Tell the board for me. And the, the tractor with it. And, and, but we harvest our own seeds because why? I'll tell you, one of the best things that we figured out is if you start paying those, those, those guys out there have remnant tracks, or relic tracks of native grass, uh, they all of a sudden find out, hey, you mean that blue stem meadow over there is worth something for seed? Yes, sir, we'll pay you for it. We're actually paying landowners much more than you get for releasing that property out for cattle grazing or for hay. Sometimes twice up to four times more than he can get for releasing that property out. So all of a sudden, we're landowners are finding out that I think I'll take care of Rob Reynolds. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You've got to give them the plants and the yes. As I said earlier, we also help them downtown. This is a medical center. This is, a, this is a, an area that we used to have a high rise on it. That's my grandson there and some other people down there. Were, that's where we started. And next slide. That's that's a picture I took not too long ago. Mainly that's yellow Indian grass. But go that spring and it's gorgeous. The the, uh, the 
wildflowers, you look like they're on steroids. I mean, they just <laughs> big time. They cause irrigation for us. But we're pretty proud of the stand, stand we got down there. Uh, and this, we planted our, we planted seed, and we also dug up some some uh, roots from uh, Eastern Gamblers and planted them down there. But it's it's quite a sight to see. I, I encourage you to go down to Fannin and, and Holcomb and see see that site. We're also working on several other acres down there. About eight. This is about two acres, maybe three. We're working on eight, eight in total down there right now. Um, and not only do the people <laughs> like it, but uh, last year, in one of the sites down there, the log, there were a big, big flock of loggerhead shrikes came in, and a butcher bird, because there were so many insects. And where else in Houston are you going to find that many flowers of insects, you know? So we had, it was amazing to see that, that, that bird just fly into that, that site. I just want to tell you in closing that, uh, you know, uh, as Aldo Leopold said, the, treat the land not as a commodity, treat it as something to which we all belong. And, and, that's, and that's what we're doing. I think we're, we're showing people, hey, let's work together, let's do it together. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a track I planted this year in some uh, old stubble. And it's a great stand of natives. But the main thing about it is it's got a lot of, we, you know, it, it brought back the wildlife we didn't think we had. So my belief, my, my, I always tell people that you can see it and believe it like that dog does his quail there. You can achieve it.
grass jill looks great when you have a lot of dirt. What if you're in like a rockier area that you really can't you can just broadcast? How rock? I mean, uh, we, we use no-till drills, but uh, it's pretty, pretty tough. What, what kind of what are we talking about? This is, oh, this we got one guy, Bob. This is country rocky. Oh, it's you're rocky. country rocky? Yeah. yeah. Well, on, those, on that rocky country, broadcasting does work well because those seeds go down and they're cracked in the rock. There you go. And all that kind of stuff. So, so that's the way to do it. That, that makes sense. Yeah. And Bob Pickens in Columbus, he, he, uh, he threw in native and uh, and uh, <coughs> no gravel hit. And he had the same problem about how Bob, Bob did, he just sort of scratched the surface, but as the gentleman said, it gets down his ball and, and hopefully it helps break the water. But, but seed selection makes a big difference. I think it's very important to get the right seed mixture. And that's what we do. We, we learn the hard way which seeds plant, which work for your particular area. Make sure your, your soil and your seeds match locally the type. It's very important. And uh, to have in your seed mixture. Or we had we had good luck with exactly what you did. We cleared a bunch of uh, cedar, ash juniper, and we have a lot of little blue stem. I just wanted to move the rest of the property. Oh, take over the KR. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I know, I know. That KR is, is, is terrible. And uh, but you know, just take patience. You know what? Roy has been on, on our property and others. We've been. As, it's easy to go out and say this is too long, you know. But I mean, it takes patience, but you know, I think IPT and uh, just in people plant feeding that they are, it, 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 Jim, I heard somebody asked about Johnson's about us. Uh, yeah. The same way, and I was uh, talking about a similar plus on it. Well, Johnson grass, fortunately now, because, you know, the, the researchers are going to try to help the, the crop producers, so they have now herbicides specifically for Johnson grass. Outrider is one of them. What, uh, oh, it's another one DuPont has. They think it's better than Outrider. But Outrider is one that's the first one. DuPont has a new one out at, uh, I don't think I've Plateau or Journey? Or? No. Plateau is the one that's fairly popular. Yeah. I think it's, yeah. I think it's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's Plateau, but this is a uh, more recent one at, at uh, the DuPont. Uh, Anyway, but yeah, there are, there are Johnson you know, those for Cisco Bob Boyd Johnson grass, and that's really good. Like they are, I mean, like uh, uh, Cimarron is just good for Bahia. Yeah. Is there one for KR? Another slide for KR? Uh, 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 big rock and a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> it's really tough. It's tough. But uh, what I'm doing is I'm just we're just uh, KR just individual plant feeding. I've been doing that for about a year and a half. And, I mean, we're almost there, but on the field for now. Yeah, I mean, you are. You've been amazing. You've been amazing. You've been amazing. Jacob, being in your topic, you mentioned that when you started this process, there was no mentor. You were the pioneer. We were. I did. 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 Other folks absolutely, outside. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, conservation is not somebody who wants to claim all the fame. You know, people like John Hayes talk like about, you know, I've got to mention John Hayes. We, 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 we have a lot of good help. And uh, like uh, 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 the... Uh, get it, get it. Uh, <laughs> the program has been very good. In some but there's a lot of good help out there, not just us. And, uh, but, yes, I... I that's what we, I, I spent a lot of time, you know, what Roy tell you, I'm on the phone with him, and he almost moves my ear every day. People going answers to questions. And it's not because I know that much. And a lot of people know a lot more than I do. It's just the fact that landowners like to talk to landowners. So my landowners is persistent, like they are has, and like many others have, and, 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 and bringing back the natives. And they say, well, they can do it, I can do it. You know, so it's, it's a little trick for trade. But I can tell you, I have made a lot of mistakes. And I wish I had me around when I started. I know, you know what I'm saying, yeah. yeah. Just, a, just a note about Jim, we, he started off, he talks about looking for agency professional staff to help yeah. him and get him started up. And he found some good ones in Stan Ranky and some of those guys. Oh. But in all honesty, are you ask any parts of wildlife guy, most NRCS guys in the area, He's now the go-to for technical expertise. We ask him, so he's kind of close to <laughs> <laughs> Well, 
uh, we had, I would have done it, I told Bob Moore, I said, you know, when you start these organizations, you feel like, oh, there's nobody else out there. And Bob and John, I joined with me, you know, you gotta have, you can't do it alone. And, and uh, but, John, you know, there's people out there that want a landowner that's persistent, and it's so easy to quit. It gets expensive, and you don't have time. You know, you got you know, my dad used to say, you don't take time, you make time. If you go through this kind of work. Okay. Out of time, we do all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's some good work.